Good morning. Welcome again to a service here at uh, Grace Community Church. It's been some time since uh, we've been in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, on Sunday morning, uh, although it was covered quite well on uh, Wednesday evenings, and uh, the Apostle Paul covers quite a range of uh, topics in the first letter to the Corinthians. And in chapter 1, Paul reminds them they are recipients of God's grace. The preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those that are lost and to those that are saved. It's the power of God. And then in chapter 2, Paul said what he shared with them was hidden revelation. And it was revealed to him for us. And then in chapter 3, Paul tells them that the way they were living meant that they were carnal. In chapter 4, Paul reminds them that they were saved as the result of hearing the gospel from him. And uh, we know the gospel is found in chapter 15, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Trusting in that and that alone and nothing else for our salvation. And then in chapter 5, a fornicator in the congregation uh, needed to be excommunicated. In chapter 6, Paul says we are not our own, but we're bought with a price, therefore glorify God. And in chapter 7, Paul dealt with the issue of marriage, to whether to marry or not. And now we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I've entitled the message, Christian liberty and Christian love. Uh, the uh, issue of eating food that has been offered to idols is what Paul is dealing with. And we're going to find out when it's okay and when it isn't okay. And so Paul begins in verse 1 by saying, We all have knowledge about the issue, but knowledge by itself is not enough. By itself, it can pu uh, puff a person up. And that means literally to inflate like, like a, a balloon. Sometimes we, we say in uh, our language probably, that sounds like a lot of hot air. But when we get to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we'll see that someone who has knowledge without love is nothing. Instead of going right to the meat issue, Paul deals with the principles of knowledge and love. And the point Paul is making is that the Christian life is based more on love than knowledge. Knowledge, as the verse says, puffs up, but love edifies. And if we're not careful, knowledge can actually lead to pride. The problem of food offered to idols doesn't really apply to us today. However, there are areas that Christians struggle with. The Nazarenes don't allow dancing. Seventh-day Adventists do not allow smoking or drinking, and eating meat is discouraged. Uh, the Quakers did not allow men and women to sit together, and I was brought up in a church like that, where men sat on one side, the women on the other, yeah, but they no longer do that. The Amish folks do not use electricity. The Mennonites, well, the women, they must wear special dresses and bonnets. The men, if they're married, need to have a beard. And uh, so these are rules that are not uh, specifically listed in the Bible as sinful. And I think uh, what uh, Paul told Timothy actually applies here. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Religion is basically a behavior modification. Christianity is heart transformation. The gospel of grace is what transforms us working through the word of God. 
So Paul here is concerned that the Corinthians would use their freedom in a way that is not hurtful to others. Christians are forgiven past, present, future sins. We have the grace of God in abundance. And yet Paul says we're not to use uh, our freedom in such a way that it's uh, harmful. The word puffs up. The words puff up in verse 1 in Greek mean arrogant and proud. What Paul is saying is that just because we have the freedom to do something doesn't mean it's the loving thing to do. It brings to my mind Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Going on in verse 2, we see how Paul addresses a conceited person. Verse 2 says, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. If I was to stand here this morning and tell you I know everything about the grace message there is to know, first of all, that wouldn't be true, but you could think of me as being uh, arrogant. Even when we know a lot, it's still lacking because we are finite. God is infinite, without limits. Only God has omniscience. God knows all things. He knows the past, the present, the future. God is the source of all knowledge. Going on in verse 2, Paul is telling the Corinthians, what they believe about food offered to idols is based on incomplete knowledge. If we think they know it all, we're mistaken. In verse 3, Paul once again points out that love is more important than knowledge. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Being known by God means we belong to him. The Lord knows those who are his, 2 Timothy 2, 9. Going on in verse 3, it identifies those he knows as the ones who love him. And it's God who made the first move, isn't it? We could say love made the first move. God is love, according to 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 19 says we love God because he first loved us. Our love for God is simply a response to his love for us. God loved us before we were capable of loving him. Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us when? While we were yet sinners. So we don't deserve his love, and yet we can have it. So Paul goes on in verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. Some of the Corinthians felt it was wrong to eat meat that had been offered to idols. In those days, you could save money by buying meat that had been sacrificed uh, to idols. It was considerably cheaper. And uh, Paul is saying, since there's only one true living God, idols are nothing. So if idols are nothing, then the meat offered them has no spiritual significance. When Paul says there is only one God, of course he's referring to three divine persons in one. God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. They are not separate, but they're all in one. And as it's stated in Colossians 2.9, for in him, or in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In verse 5, the Apostle Paul calls anything other than the one true God, so-called gods. And it's really quite a list. 
had a list of the uh, of the gods here, and it, I guess I don't really have it now. But there was Aphrodite, there was Diosthenes, uh, Zeus. I, I can't remember them all. Uh, Bonea, Poseidon. And Paul is saying none of them have a real existence, whether in heaven or earth. And what does Paul mean by many lords in verse 5? A lord often refers to a leader, and God is greater than a leader, any leader who has power. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, God is referred to as the Lord of Lords. In the Psalms, God is referred to as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul affirms that true Christians acknowledge there is one God, one God of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus, through whom are all things. One God of whom are all things, and Christ through whom are all things. Once again, it points to the fact that Jesus is God. In the Titus 2.13, we find the words, Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Together, both Father and Son exist as one in the Trinity with the Holy Spirit. They are distinct in their roles and functions, and yet mysteriously, they're still one. Verse 6, in reference to God the Father, says, We are in Him or as the Greek puts it, unto the end of him. God is the object to be glorified. In reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and we by him. God the Father is the source of all things. The Son is the agent of all things. And then uh, verse 6 ends, and through whom we live. Sometimes we find encouragement in the Bible in just a few words. For example, we're in Christ, Christ in us. We are complete in Christ. There's nothing missing when we're in Christ. And now 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says that we are through him. Now we know how we can say that we're complete in him. Romans 3.24 says we are justified through the redemption in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.7 says in whom Christ we have redemption through his blood. Romans 5.1 says therefore having been justified by faith, uh, faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 2 goes on to say, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse 7, Paul is referring to Christians that don't understand that an idol was nothing and that eating, eating meat offered to an idol is really not a problem. They were lacking in their understanding of Christian liberty. Paul said, their conscience being weak is defiled. Let your conscience be your guide is always, not always, the right approach. They were using their conscience independent of the word of God. The word conscience comes from two words, know and with. The weak Christian will allow something from the past to distort his conscience. Since he can't ignore it, it becomes defiled with guilt and confusion. A strong conscience, on the other hand, is focused on the Word of God. Paul goes on in verse 8, not eating food sacrificed to idols doesn't uh, have anything to do with our 
standing before God, or our, it doesn't commend us before God. That word commend means to present for approval. God's approval is not based on what we do, but on what Christ has done on the cross. And conscience can be a good thing as long as it doesn't conflict with the word of God. It brings to mind 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. The ultimate authority comes from the word of God. And according to Romans 14.17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The verse tells us how we stand, verse 9 tells us how we should treat those who are weak in the faith. Our freedom in Christ can cause harm to those who may have convictions about certain matters. If it violates their conscience, it becomes a stumbling block. In this case, the issue is meat offered to idols, but we can see how liberty in Christ can carry over to other areas as well and present a problem. What's interesting about all of this, if we do something that we feel is not approved by God, it's a sin, even if in reality it's not wrong. And that's backed up in Romans 14, 22. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. And then verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If something causes us to think it may not be pleasing to God, then the thing to do is not do it. There was a time when I was convinced for health reasons that being a vegan was the way to go. It was uh, suggested by someone that I was a weak brother because I wasn't eating meat. And I had an answer for that person who actually was a pastor. And I took him to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, where it says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient or beneficial. So in, that, in my case, not eating meat had nothing to do with my conscience, actually, but everything to do with health. And I no longer follow that lifestyle but I'm uh, convinced it has some merit. But eating meat in my presence was not a, a stumbling block. There are people who are vegans for religious reasons. To serve them meat at a meal would be wrong, wouldn't it? It's a matter of having love and concern for others. So going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. The Apostle Paul poses a question to the Corinthians. Would the weaker Christian be influenced to eat idle food when he sees another Christian doing it, even though his conscience tells him not to? That could very well be the case, would it not? Paul is making the point that liberty requires judgment when it comes to a weaker brother. Freedom does not mean free from all restraint. The danger is the weak Christian will do what they believe God does not want them to do. Even though it's not wrong to eat food uh, sacrificed to an idol, and now it raises the question of why do we do what we do? What's the motive for our actions? Paul goes on to explain the implications in the rest of the chapter. In verse 11, Paul reminds the Corinthians that Christ died for those who have a weak conscience. And he viewed the weaker Christian as having the possibility of perishing. The word perishing can be translated as coming to an end or ruined. 
causing a weak brother to stumble could have serious consequences. The weaker Christian has value because Christ died for his sins. Paul talks about a similar situation in Romans 14, 15. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Here the Apostle Paul brings love into the equation. He's saying if you love your fellow Christian, a weaker brother in this case, you will not flaunt your freedom. Paul is telling them we was, must not for the sake of food hurt someone for whom Christ died. A Christian who causes harm to another Christian is not walking in love. According to the Apostle Paul, walking in love requires the more mature Christian to take into consideration how our actions affect others. The principle of love takes precedence over the principle of liberty. When that's lacking, Paul tells the Corinthians they're sinning against Christ. And according to verse 12, but when you sin so against the brethren and would their weak conscience, you're, you sin against Christ. All Christians are members of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 verifies that. For one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let's consider that weaker Christian this morning. It's easy for us to think that the Christians, or rather the Corinthians, should have known better. On the other hand, they did not know what we know thanks to the progressive revelation that Paul received later on. What is it that would make the weaker brother stronger? It's the word of God, isn't it? Colossians 2.10 says we are complete in Christ. Because of our union with Christ, we don't lack anything. That's our position from the moment of our salvation. God sees us as forgiven. God sees us as righteous, as Christ is righteous. When we understand that, then we're free to serve the Lord with a clear conscience. If the Corinthians had known that, I believe it would have made a difference. To be established in the faith, we needed to be rooted and built up in Christ then our attitude will be the same as what we find in Colossians 2.16. No one is to judge us in meat or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath days. The simple truth is this. We are free to eat and drink whatever you like. The Bible does condemn drunkenness, however. Scripture forbids a Christian from doing anything that might offend other Christians or encourage them to sin against his conscience. The issue in our context was meat offered to idols, but it can apply to other areas as well. In verse 13, we see how important Paul considers not causing someone to stumble to be. If there's any chance the food he eats will cause another Christian to stumble into sin, he, he would go, according to our verse, as far as to not eat meat of any kind. He would sacrifice his liberty for the sake of a weaker brother. Paul's example calls for believers to set aside their rights for the sake of others. In 1 Corinthians 8, 13, Paul presents his own personal conviction on the matter. He shares how he's willing to limit his own personal liberty if it will prevent another believer from stumbling. So what we've seen here in chapter 8 is that Christians sometimes believe things that are not true. We're reminded again how important it is 
to focus on the gospel of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul began chapter 8 dealing with knowledge and love. He explained for us that love's the, uh, the way to go when knowledge in a weaker brother is lacking. A weak person today is not likely struggling with food sacrificed to idols. On the other hand, what could be freedom for one person could be something the other person is struggling with. We can be 100% right and 100% wrong at the same time. To avoid that, we can take the admonition in Philippians 2.4 to heart. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And I believe Acts 20.32 is a fitting verse to close with this morning. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word directed to us. Thankful, Father, for the admonition to be channels of your love and instruments of your will. Help us, Father, to grow in your knowledge and in, in applying it uh, as well. And Father, if there's anyone listening to my voice this morning who has not trusted Christ for salvation, let it be known that it's a free gift. Salvation is a gift that cannot be earned it's simply a matter of trusting in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. And we'll give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen.